Good afternoon. Welcome, Thank Professor you. Denny Marischal. Thank you. Um, it's great to hear you talking this afternoon about your background and the ideas that you've had in terms of educational neuroscience, particularly in relation to teaching and learning. Perhaps we could start by just you giving us a background of your career and how you've got to where you are. I guess I have a slightly bizarre background for someone who works in education. Um, I'm originally a physicist by training, but about three years into my physics background, I realized that um, children are a lot more interesting than rocks. Um, and really what fascinates me is understanding learning. Um, after all, we all start as children um, and we end up with who we are and understanding the process uh, by which that happens and how that happens in the brain is really what excites me in my research. In terms of sort of background in relation to neuroscience mm -hmm. and psychology, what were the key elements there that started to focus you in particularly on the work you're doing now? Well, I think, um, you know, the brain is the final frontier. Um, it's really one of the areas that we understand the least in human uh, physiology and in human development. And uh, we at least have this kind of introspective sense that the brain is important for something. Um, and yet, bizarrely, in the 1980s, there was a belief that you could study learning and children without any reference to the brain at all. And I really thought that must be wrong. So it's trying to bring together the great discoveries of the last 20 years in how the brain functions with children's learning that has really brought me to where I am now. Do you think there are any key lessons that you've picked up from the research that you've done that particularly move us that we need to take note of? I think the, the probably the basic fundamental lesson that we can take away from this is that it's essential to understand the mechanisms of learning. So what the brain teaches us is how learning takes place. Not just what children can learn at various ages, but how that unfolds, how we can present information to children and to the children's brain in the most optimal way so that they can take up that information as effectively as possible um, for their age. How do you think the sort of mechanisms of the brain, how can you relate the findings that we've got to behaviour? I know you're a big fan of Piaget, for example. <laughs> yes. um, and, and to some extent in education, he was, Absolutely. if you like, the god. Yes. But has gone into a little bit of a decline sure. in a way. So how do you see these relating together? Well, he's certainly one of the most influential thinkers that, uh, in, in developmental psychology that I can think of. Um, I think where Piagetian ideas are wrong is that development in the brain is really continuous. So even if children's performance seems to progress through kind of starts and stops I and mean, discontinuities, there's a real gradual accumulation of knowledge and of change underlying all of that in the brain. So I think the big lessons are that uh, learning really takes place through many, many gradual repetitions of information. I think the key process also that occurs during child development in the brain is the kind of improved coordination and control of information. So we see that first with Im improved kind of self-control in children, regulating your behavior, which allows you to kind of uh, take up more information from the classroom because you're not disruptive, but also the kind of frontal and executive parts of the brain are learning to control the other systems in the brain more effectively and more efficiently. And this is what gives us the kind of increased reasoning power and learning ability on top of, of course, greater knowledge that comes with increased age. So I, I know you work with children, you go into classrooms sure. regularly yourself, and you're working with, with, with young children. Um, how do you think their brains, I, I'm going to say work, but it's not quite sure. right, differently from adults? And what are the key things that teachers probably need to take on board? Ooh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> there are many ways in which they differ, but I think the overarching um, if, I, if there was one overarching lesson, it was to say that really children's brains are still coming to terms, uh, gaining the ability to co coordinate multiple sources of information. So not overpowering the child with multiple um, sources of information, lots of excessive information, helping them focus on the one key part of information of a lesson at a time uh, is very beneficial. But also, um, the different parts of the brain that are involved in, say, emotional regulation, as well as kind of intellectual regulation, are only just starting to, at least in early childhood, are only just starting to, to work together effectively. In court. So understanding that the control of their emotional state is not always as fine-tuned as it is in adults um, is, is also an important lesson. And, and would you agree that it's the interaction between both the emotional, the intellectual, and the other aspects 
that are important that sometimes get neglected? That's certainly one dimension, absolutely. <clears throat> so one of the key dimensions is the control of the self, of, of control of information that I mentioned before. But the other dimension, I think, is the um, often neglected link between the emotional state of the child, the affective state of the child, how rewarding they're finding a situation, how curious and engaged they are by the situation, the interaction of those states with the kind of intellectual learning states. Of it. So um, in adults, we may not like a particular situation, uh, find it unpleasant, perhaps slightly frightening, um, because we don't think we'll perform, but we're able to kind of control those feelings well enough to get over them and then take on the lesson or the work. Children are going to be struggling for, with that a lot more than um, adults or older teenagers. And I know you've done a lot of work on reasoning. Yes. What are some of the first steps that we need to be thinking about to help children engage with those processes and develop them as they get older? So reasoning is, is, a, is a complicated subject. Um, it was actually one of the core uh, fundamental skills that Piaget was aiming to um, elucidate. And he claimed that it wasn't until about 11 years of age that children reach kind of mature adult levels of reasoning. Um, I don't think we believe that anymore. We think that the fundamental building blocks of reasoning are in place from very, very early childhood preschool. Um, but again, it's a question of uh, maintaining the kind of executive control in, during a task. So uh, teaching children to persevere with particular problems, to explore all the possible solutions rather than just the, the first one that captures their attention. Um, I think that that is really the biggest lesson that we can um, provide for teachers who are trying to instill better reasoning skills. Thinking a bit more generally, you know, um, obviously there is still a little bit of debate around the idea that findings from neuroscience can actually inform teaching and learning and support teachers and other people working with young children. You know, where do you sit in that and, and, and what's your argument for your position? Well, um, you know, it depends what you mean by neuroscience. So neuroscience is a very, very broad term. At one level, at the basic level, neuroscience is about studying cells and chemicals in the brain. Um, and clearly that's very far away from what's going on in, in the classroom, the complex social dynamics of the, of the classroom. Um, where I sit, as I think where a lot of educational neuroscientists sit, um, it's suggesting that cognitive neuroscience can be the kind of link between the basic neuroscience and, and the practice. Um, so cognitive neuroscience is looking at skills that are important for everyday life, our reasoning skills, um, numeracy skills, uh, literacy skills, and asking questions about what kind of learning mechanisms underlie improvements in those particular domains. Um, so in a way, I think where I stand, and I think edu other educational neuroscientists stand, is as a kind of translator between the basic neuroscience research of how the basic mechanisms of the brain work with the real life problems faced by educa ed educators in real schools. It's not a single link, is what I'm guessing. It's much more complex than that, but we need to be aware that we're talking about multiple links not single links. Absolutely, absolutely. Lots and lots of links. And even between you know, our position, um, which I'll say, which I suggest is, is still a fairly basic science perspective of understanding reasoning and reading in, in very pure context uh, between our position and the position of the practitioner in the classroom who has 30 children, um, maybe five of whom only come to school three days a week, is trying to manage this whole situation. There is a big gap. Um, so I think more work needs to be done in trying to bridge that gap if the benefits that we get from taking the brain seriously to understand learning can really permeate to um, practice in the classroom. We've had the pleasure, I, when I say we learners, have had the pleasure of working with you and the team on the Unlock project where we've been trying to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Take the research, translate it so it can be used in, in the classroom. What do you think are some of the messages that we've learned from that exercise of yeah. being involved in that link? Well, I think it's a pleasure for me too. It's been a pleasure for me too. Um, I think for me one of the key conclusions to draw from that is that um, there are good intentions in all parts but the two worlds, the practitioners and even the, the basic cognitive neuro neuroscience researchers um, are not fully aware of the constraints that operate in each other's different worlds. Um, so the scientists are not fully aware necessarily of um, the, the complex constraints that the teachers and other practitioners are operating under and the, the, the teachers and practitioners may not really be aware of the, the real constraints that operate on the limits of our knowledge at the, the science level. 
Um, so in fact, I think one of the, great, the greatest things we could do to improve that link is to develop a kind of system of, of maybe exchanges or, or internships where scientists spend a week in, in a school, seeing what a school really is like. And perhaps some teachers would come and work in a lab or spend some time shadowing in a lab to understand the real um, painful limits that exist in trying to understand how the brain really works. Yeah. We, we um, all have our constraints that we've indeed, got to fight indeed. our way through. Yeah. Do you see the role, you know, to a certain extent, that we try to play as part of that? Um, mm -hmm. project, the partnership between organizations like Learners, of which there aren't many, if any of others, course. Um, and, and, and researchers yourself. What, what do you see that the relationship should develop? Well, I, I think one of the reasons I keep working with this organization, Learners, is because it, it plays an invaluable role. So I was talking about the different sets of constraints that the practitioners had and, and the scientists have. Along with those constraints um, uh, uh, related to knowledge, they have constraints on their time. And even with good intentions, they don't necessarily have the time to find out what the other side is doing um, in great detail. And I think there's really a role for an intermediary, such as what Learnis is doing, to kind of communicate the message, pass the messages back and forth between the education world and the basic science world. Acting as an active conduit. Correct. Um, yes. As well as an interface. I I yes, indeed, indeed. Often. Um, <laughs> to use a, a colloquial expression, um, forcing people to put their money where their mouth is. So many people <laughs> voice the desire to have collaborations, but simply don't have the time or space to do it. Yeah. And when there's a third party that is actually prompting them to do that, it actually creates real links. Looking ahead, you know, sort of, what do you see as some of the major challenges that we've got in this whole field of educational neuroscience, informing teaching and learning? Mm -hmm. And what's the time scale on it? The time scale. I, um, I, think, I think one of the greatest obstacles is still a misunderstanding of what the other side is, where, is capable of. Um, I, think, I think, as I said earlier, the uh, neuroscientists perhaps don't have a full understanding of the constraints that educational practitioners work under. Um, and the educational practitioners don't understand how slow progress can be in science. Mm. Um, so even a project that runs over three or five years may be an insufficient amount of time to provide an answer that can be translated into a practical um, solution in, in, in the real world. So I think understanding the real constraints that operate is, is, is one of the big challenges that we should continue to meet. The time scale over which this will operate, um, I'm afraid I'm not quite as optimistic as some people. <laughs> I think it, we really need a, a change in mindset, a change perhaps in the kind of training that's provided to educational practitioners uh, to provide them with um, maybe, there are many educational practitioners who have a lot of interest in the scientific basis of learning, per, but perhaps many of them uh, see that as a smaller part of all the responsibilities mm -hmm. they may have. Um, similarly, uh, there are many cognitive neuroscientists um, who don't see education as a top priority. They look at more um, what they might perceive as grander questions of learning more generally or knowledge more generally yeah. without specifically thinking of it in the context of an educational um, institution. If you had a magic wand, <laughs> what would you want to see happen and or put in place in order to move things forward? I think if I had a magic wand, um, apart from a lot of money, um, what we would need uh, is really col um, collaboratively trained individuals who are both practicing educations and uh, practicing scientists as well. So um, here at Birkbeck, we have an MSc program which is designed to try to do that, to bring together teachers or head teachers with scientists and train them in, in, in both worlds. Uh, the kind of internship schemes that I mentioned earlier on, I think would be a good idea as well. Um, the Royal Society used to have a program which invited teachers, uh, practicing teachers, to work in science laboratories um, or scientists to spend time in schools in order to really get a handle on the, the uh, constraints in, in both domains. Um, unfortunately, the take up was so low that they discontinued that scheme. I think that was a mistake, and I think we should be trying to encourage more people to take up those sorts of opportunities. And to get those sort of exchanges. We do it in, right. in other areas Indeed. of industry, so why can't we do it in this field? Absolutely, yes. Couldn't that's, agree more. That's an interesting challenge and yeah. something to give us plenty of thinking to, to do going forward, um, as well as all the, sort of the basic stuff. So 
Denny, thank you very much indeed for sharing some of your thoughts with us today. Thank you. And I'm sure people will find those very useful. Thank you. Thank you.